Danielle, and I move around a lot up here. Do you guys like that? And I get really animated, and I even yell, but I'm not usually mad when I yell, so please don't think I'm mad at you when I yell, okay? Because I just, I just get so passionate, and I love bringing the word of God. It's one of my favorite things to do. It actually probably is my favorite thing to do on the planet. And I even have a whiteboard, okay? Who sees this and starts sweating, thinking we're doing math problems? I know, okay? We're not doing math problems today, okay? I just thought something that I was going to say would be better shown. Okay? You guys cool with that? Okay. No flashbacks to high school. Nobody wants that. All right. So uh, like I said, my name's Danielle. Um, I was here in the beginning with my parents and started the father's house in 1998. I was 10 years old. Just a little, little tomboy girl who loved to play sports and never was in Southside. And that was quite a culture shock for me. Um, But let me tell you something. I was actually worshiping just now, and um, I just, I just need to say thank you. This place, this, this place has healed me. This place, you guys have healed me. You've, you've changed me. Um, In the beginning, the enemy tried to hurt me pretty bad through this, through people here, and uh, you guys have restored me. On Wednesday night. I tanked pretty bad in worship, and I mean pretty bad, I mean really bad, Uh, (laughs) and you guys started cheering for me, and and you healed me on Wednesday night, so um, I'm in this process of being healed, like I I hope all of us are, uh, being transformed and changed, I'm in the process of becoming Jesus, you know what I mean, being holy as he is holy, and I just, I just need to say that I'm a daughter of this house, and I love being a daughter of this house, and I haven't always been a daughter of this house. And uh, so thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, That leads me to what we're talking about tonight, uh, today. I made a promise to you guys a long time ago that I would never speak unless it was from my heart. I won't just speak from my brain, although that helps a little bit. (laughs) But I'll speak from my heart. And that's what I'm going to do today. The Lord's been revealing something to me. He's been teaching me pretty uh, strictly about a certain thing, and I really feel like it's for a lot of people in here. So we're going to talk about serving another man's vision. Uh Uh-oh. I know. the, The air just got sucked out. Great leaders are first great followers. Always. Truly great leaders are always first great followers. And, you know, a lot of people go to, uh, to college to get theology degrees and stuff like that. But sometimes they try to break things so down that they miss the big themes in the Bible. And there's a couple big themes. One of them I'm going to give you for free. It's not even going to be part of my message. But the only thing that's predictable about God is he's unpredictable. We decide plans for him, and it never turns out the way we did. Just look at the Jews, okay? The Old Testament is all about men predicting or deciding for God how he should be and how he should act, and it never turning out well. Okay? So that one is for free. You're welcome. Okay, but a huge theme in the Bible are these incredibly great leaders, the incre- these incredibly great men who started by serving another man's vision, who, who had a call on their life as big as the call of David, but first he had to serve another man to the point of death, Okay? These men who had to serve another man humbly before the call of God on their, before God gave them the call that that was on their life. This is a hard message because there are not a lot of great men out there today. And in our lives, we have a lot of men and women who have caused us so much pain and caused us so much misery that we've lost faith in humanity. We've lost the ability to trust. We've lost the the ability to, to have faith in people. And so we do something that I did a long time ago. We become orphans. Whether you had great parents or you had not so great parents, you have a choice to be a daughter or son or an orphan. I had incredible parents. My dad provided for me the whole time I was growing up. My, my mom nurtured me and comforted me. She, she taught me and my dad told me who I was. But because of hurt, because of pain, I chose to be an orphan. Because I didn't want to be hurt anymore. I was a sensitive little thing, man. I was so sensitive. Holy smokes. As shy as they come. When I hit about 12 or 13, 
I decided I'm so sick and tired of being hurt. I'm so sick and tired of this, of people having access to me, of trusting people and them letting me down, of not understanding me, of being a target. I was such a target. Holy smokes. I was. That you know what? I don't want to. I don't want to follow anybody. mm -mm, I'm good. And so there are some definite things that orphans do. Orphans self-protect. They're in charge of protecting themselves. They self-promote. They have to talk about how good they are because no one else did. That's your parents are supposed to do that. They're, They're supposed to say, wow, Danielle, great job. You're amazing. Keep playing basketball. One day that's going to pay off. That's what your parents' job is, but you don't get that, so you have to do it for yourself. Self-provide. Maybe you, 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 the things that you needed growing up, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically, wasn't provided for you, so you had to provide for yourself, so you rely on yourself. These are all things that I struggled with. Self-assure. Maybe you had to be your own confidence. Maybe you had to build yourself up. Maybe you had to decide for yourself who you are. You won't let other people tell you who you are. This is the orphan spirit that's plaguing our churches. For kids like me that grew up with incredible parents, they're plaguing our churches. The millennials is the worst I've ever seen of people needing to promote themselves, needing to bypass this crucial step that God designed from the beginning of, the, beginning of the world to follow a man and, 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 and serve his vision. It's fathering and mothering as a, a daughter or son. You're supposed to serve the vision of your father. That's how it was designed. But in our broken world, it gets broken. And we operate in this orphaness. And the, in Hebrews, it literally says, if you cannot be, become a son and daughter and you cannot be disciplined by the Lord, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Hebrews 12. It literally says that. That we have to become sons and daughters. And you're like, well, Danielle, t- tell me more about, about this following other men stuff because, you know, that's, I, don't, I don't really think that. So, so Elisha. Elisha had this huge calling. He had to first serve Elijah. It actually said he became Elijah's servant. He was a farmer and he came, became Elijah's servant. And he never left his side. And he made Elijah famous. And Elisha got a double portion. Joseph served Potiphar to the point of pain, to the point of being tr- betrayed. And then he went and served the, um, the king of Egypt. He served Egypt, the country that wasn't even his own, before God gave him the calling that was on his life. We all have a calling on our life. See, the world will be changed if they could hear this message. I know it. The Christian world would be transformed if we could understand serving some, another man's vision. It will be absolutely transformed. A whole group of people going after one thing. And then out of that birthing, out of that one thing, birthing these incredible things. But my generation, maybe your generation, the generation after me, always has to look out for our, ourselves, our calling. Part of the problem with the prophetic generation right now is everyone gets these callings, which are awesome. I have a calling, it's incredible. I love it. I'm so excited. Hopefully one day it happens. It gives us hope. But we start serving our calling. We start serving this vision that we were given. Instead of saying, you know what, Lord, I trust you because I'm your daughter. And you'll provide and protect. And and, and I have faith, God, that you gave me that. So I'm going to put that aside and I'm going to serve the man you put in front of me. I'm going to serve his vision until you give that back to me. And I'm going to learn to be humble. And I'm going to learn to follow. And I'm going to learn to lead when there's not as much pressure. And I'm going to stop for the person in front of me, Lord. And if one day you give that calling back to me, that's awesome. Praise the Lord. But that's the problem with this prophetic generation. Prophecy is becoming an idol. And we're not stopping for the person in front of us because it's not part of our calling. I'm called to go to Africa. I'm not going to go help the elderly. This is my generation, people, millennials. We got to wake up. We are the movers and the shakers, but we're moving and shaking in the wrong direction. We got to honor the generations before us. The Jewish tradition was so good at honoring the, the, the generation before them and working under them and gaining all the wisdom and authority and power that comes through serving them. They were so good. I'm going to give you some more examples. 
Esther, holy smokes, submitted to the king of Persia. This dude was crazy. (laughs) She submitted her whole body, her whole life, her whole future to this guy. And God gave her authority over everything. Submission to authorities. It's so important and it's been so abused. I mean, I could go on and on in the Old Testament, but I think we're going to switch to the New Testament, the apostles. How many apostles were there? How many disciples were there? I believe that two of the disciples didn't get it. Obviously, we know that Judas was a little confused. Okay, he did not serve Jesus' vision. That's probably pretty obvious, okay? But then there's this guy named Peter. Judas and Peter actually, you know, what I believe were part of this um, political affiliation called zealots. They believed in the Messiah as a warrior king. And I believe, I truly believe Judas was trying to cause Jesus to rise up and become the warrior king. That's what I believe. You know, take it with a grain of salt. But Peter, in all his braveness in the Garden of Gethsemane, pulls out his sword You know, macho man courageous and cuts off the servant's ear. The servant's ear. You know, there was like hundreds of soldiers, and he cuts off the servant's ear. Why did he do that? Because I believed his vision for Jesus was to be the warrior king. And he let his vision distract him from what was really going on in serving Jesus' vision. And he ends up disowning him. Jesus, three times, because he's so confused, because his, how he thought it should go went crazy. How he thought Jesus was supposed to act, how he thought Jesus' vision was supposed to play out went crazy. And now Jesus is about to die, and he's like, what the heck, who am I serving, what's going on, holy smokes, oh my gosh. You know, we call it the spiral, he's spiraling, right? <laughs> oh, and he disowns Jesus three times, and then, and then he starts in, in uh, then he starts and goes fishing, and he's not even a fisherman, and he, he just doesn't even know who he is anymore, and it's like he's serving this vision that wasn't really God's plan. And so let's turn to uh, John twenty one fifteen through 19. This is one of our favorite stories here. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? So Jesus had died, rose again, and met Peter on the beach. Peter comes, jumps in the water and runs toward, or swims towards Jesus. And this is their conversation. You guys with me? Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, which probably is pretty normal. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. This is Jesus saying, Peter, are you with me now? Are we on the same page now? Because we got a little confused. And what does he do after, jo- after Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you, I'm with you? He gives him his call. First, Peter has to be on the same page with Jesus. He has to submit to the vision of Jesus. These 12 men submitted to the vision of Jesus for over three years, putting 100% of their life into what Jesus was saying. 100%. It wasn't about their vision and their call and their, their stuff. Be, you know, they all ended up uh, going to be, like Paul went out to be, a, he wasn't part of the 12, but he went out to be a missionary. You know, they were sent all over the place to different places, but that was after they submitted to the call and the vision of Jesus Christ. So why am I talking about this? I told you I was going to speak from my heart. Uh, about... I've been going through this thing where God showed me I chose to be an orphan. It's been awesome. No, it hasn't. God just pulling out the weeds of my heart, you know, like, in what places am I not being a daughter? So recently, I was praying, and I was telling Derek, uh, Derek's my husband, 
just, um, I don't know if you caught that my dad's a senior pastor here. I work for him. Okay, that was an important part of the story. I was sitting there and recognizing, why do my dad and I butt heads so much? We butt heads, okay? Fact. Why do we butt heads so much? He drives me nuts sometimes, you know? And the Holy Spirit very ungently said, you haven't submitted to him. I'm like, what are you talking about? I gave up a six-figure job to come serve his vision in Orville. I made no money to come do what he wanted me to do. All my actions, what are you talking about, God? All my actions show that I serve his vision. I'm submitted to him. I don't care about your, I don't, I don't care about that. That's what he said to me. What about your heart? You're withholding part of your heart. And that's why you can't agree with him. You don't need to be right. You need to make him right. I mean, you don't need to make him right. I can use him. I'm, I'm big enough. You need to serve him. Holy smokes. This is my dad and my boss. It's hard. You hear me? <laughs> so I was like, okay, so I'm talking to Derek about it. And Derek, in all his Holy Spirit wisdom, said, well, you should go apologize to your dad. Oh, come on. <laughs> Good thing it was dark, a little dark in the room. He didn't see me roll my eyes. Uh, but <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? No, I, I repented right here to Jesus. You know, I'm good. I'll change. Woohoo! You know, Holy Spirit says, no, Daniel, he's right. You need to go repent to your dad. And I was like, he showed me that in my past, there's these big leaders in my life who didn't see me, who didn't see my talent, who overlooked me, who uh, were pretty brutal, for lack of a better word, and how me holding back part of myself was how I protected myself. So when they hurt me, they didn't hurt all of me, that I still had something for me. You know what I mean? Because of fear. Because of my orphanness, my need to be self-protected. And so um, this is what he showed me. You guys ready? Um, he showed me that this is my dad. Whoop, whoop. Here he is. We'll give him a little muscle. Should we give him a little muscle? He's 61. There you go. Get a little furrowed brow. There we go. Well, we'll do a smile, but a furrowed brow smile. Okay. A little mohawk that he has, whatever that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Steve, there he is. Hey, I gave him muscles and a smile, okay? All right. <laughs> this is an incredible man right here, okay? This right here is an incredible man. We'll, we'll take away the mohawk. There we go. There's Steve. All right. <laughs> I'm a pretty good athlete, but I'm not a good draw, drawing person, okay? So this is Danielle saying, yes, yeah, Steve. I'm serving your vision. Toot, 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 toot. I know. You guys, it's all going to make sense. Yes, Steve. Woo -woo, serving your vision. All the while, I'm serving my vision as well. A house divided against itself cannot. <laughs> you all have probably the desire to speak in front of people. You have the desire to be promoted. You have the desire to be seen. We have the desire. It's a human desire that we have for our life to be the person. Woo. Ha. Okay. Serving him, I was still looking opportunities to serve my vision. Who can I meet? Who can I see? How can I, how can I put myself out there? How can I do this? Ooh, how can I make myself look so nice? Okay. Now this is real stuff. Okay. We all struggle with it. I'm willing for you to learn from me. Um, and God showed me that this, serving my vision while serving his vision was wrong. He showed me that. Because this was, well, if this doesn't work out, I still have this. My safety net. Because you don't know this, but about three years ago, the Lord told me, you need to make your dad famous. That's my only direction for you. You need to promote your dad and make him famous. What about me, Lord? What about your will for my life? Did you forget me? What about my calling, Lord? How come you gave me all these gifts just to serve his vision? You guys hear what I'm saying? You picking up what I'm putting down? I know you are because this is dead quiet in here. If you hear a pin drop, 
if you're online, maybe it's quiet there too. <laughs> what about me? That's the orphan. Because the kid knows, the child knows that if my dad becomes famous and all these amazing things happen to him, guess where that blessing flows? It doesn't blow, flow up. Guess where it flows? Guess who's down? Revelation, poop. Did I blow your mind? <laughs> Tried. And I don't serve his vision for the purpose of my vision coming true. That's wrong. I serve his vision for the purpose of his vision coming true. Jesus served his father to the point of death. Even in the garden, he was like, can you please, can we find another way? Nope. Okay, God. Father, I'll serve you. So, like any spanking you get from the Lord, I went to my dad in his truck, and I sat down and I looked at him. I said, I've been wrong. I've withheld myself from you. Looking out for myself while also looking out for you. It's why I argue with you all the time. It's why when I think you're making a poor decision, which he doesn't really, it's just my perception, I get so frustrated because it ruins mine. I said, Dad, please forgive me. I will never do that again. I'm going to live to make you famous. I'm going to serve your vision even when it hurts. When I think you're wrong, I'm still going to do what you tell me because you're a good man. In my whole life, you've been faithful. In my whole life, you've served Jesus and never looked back, and you've never hurt anybody on purpose. Because you're a man worth following, and I've watched your life. And I know that if all I ever do is pursue your vision, it's going to be amazing. And I'm sorry. And dad, so-and-so really, I can't say it out loud, so-and-so really injured me. They never saw me. I never got what I deserved. <laughs> and in true Steve fashion, he goes, well, I've been waiting for you to come to that conclusion. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> and we hugged, and I made a promise. This is going to die. That vision God gave for my life, it's going to shelve it. And I'm going to know that God is more powerful than anything I could ever imagine. And he can cause that to come true if he wants to through this vision. And one day he might call me out of this vision. But that's not my job to determine that. It's his job and his job. Because this is a good man. It's the best man I've ever met. My husband is right there passing him one day. And I know that if I stay with him and I honor him, it's going to turn out really well for me in the land. That's what being a son and daughter is. He protects me. He protects me. Submit to my husband. We're both submitted to his vision. Who are you submitted to? You like me? Always worried about how you're going to be seen? How it's going to be made away for you? How much do you really trust God? You say you trust him. I say I trust him, but when the rubber meets the road, how much do we really trust him? Can he... Make my calling come true, even me working in the slums in Brazil. How big do I really think my Father God is? How much am I really submitted to him and to the men he put in my life as leaders? Now, this is a huge responsibility for leadership that too many leaders take way too lightly. I will never do that. This is a call to Christians, say, Christian leaders saying, be men, be women, 
who understand the authority that God has given you, the responsibility of men's lives in your hands. Don't let them down. Be submitted. This is a huge call for us, but this is an even huger caller for the leaders. Be who you say that you are. Don't be an orphan anymore. We're going to turn to Hebrews 13, 15 through 17. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of the lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must Give an account. Leaders, lead in a way where you understand that at the end of time, you're going to give account for every person God put in your hands and how you led them. If we did that, if we didn't just promote leaders because they're gifted teachers, we didn't just promote leaders because they're, they, they're charismatic, but we promoted leaders with sound character who we can place men in their hands and women in their hands, and we know that when they give an account to Jesus, they will be, they will be pure. Because we understand the responsibility of the cross and we understand the responsibility in the mantle of leadership. Obey them. So he's telling us, obey your leaders so that their work will be a joy and not a burden. For that would be of no advantage to obey your leaders and submit to their authority. Submit to their vision. Make their work your joy. We got people in, in, at the father's house working in kids that before they came here didn't really even like kids. And they're like, you're putting me in kids. What the, what the heck? And then they grow to have joy in it, and they serve the vision, and they love it. We are called to be sons and daughters, and sons and daughters serve their father on earth and in heaven. And your father in heaven is telling you to serve the leader in your life, serve their vision. Believe that God the Father will protect you, will provide for you, will tell you who you are. The biggest fruit in my life has been the last six years, and I've had some pretty prestigious things happen for me. College, sports, money, a little bit of fame, if you can call it that, record books. I've had more fruit in the last five years of having to die to myself, serve someone else's vision, than I ever thought possible. Ever. And now it's starting to click. I'm, I'm operating as a daughter. I feel bad for James. You guys feel bad for James? He had to serve his brother? Ugh. <laughs> I was thinking that today. That would be hard. You know, but that's what we're called to do. Sorry, that was, a, that was for free. Okay. <laughs> you guys picking up what I'm putting down? In every man's heart in this room, every woman's heart in this room, I think you're a little bit like me. Concerned about what you're getting out of it. About how you're going to look. How you're going to be provided for. How you're going to be seen. How, how is this calling going to play out in my life? I'm called to be a preacher. How, who, who's promoting me to preacher? This last week I, I was talking to some guy. And he was like, I had to leave my church because their vision didn't match with my vision. And I said, okay, tell me about it. He said, I was telling them what they needed to change and what they were doing wrong, and they weren't doing it, so I had to leave. I said, okay, well, what part of, is it your responsibility to first serve their vision and then the church, serve the church's vision? Where's your responsibility in that? They're not supposed to accept your vision. You're supposed to come alongside them and, and build up their vision. And then God and all of his authority and power will bring your vision path through. It happens happens so much in the Bible. This is huge, huge, huge theme. It happens over and over and over and over and over again. So we have a couple things going on here. We have a whole group of us that still have the orphan mentality. Maybe we're growing in daughters, but we still think like orphans. We got to lay that down. The Bible says you have to become sons and daughters. It says it in there over and over and over again. Read Hebrews 12. That one's tough. 
We got to get rid of that. Find someone you can serve. Their vision. This is the, the recipe for success. I'm actually giving to you. Like I'm putting it in your hands right now. You want to be successful? Go find someone, a man in authority who is worthy of the position. Not just by your eyes, but worthy. Has good fruit. And, and make his vision come true. You, you, if, if, we, if this church did that, if we were all on the same page and did that, Orville would have been changed 10 years ago. If we were all in the vision of nobody in Orville goes without a meal. No kids go without, without being, being loved and hugged. And, and no addicts go without at least the choice to, to be turned around. Can you imagine if a church of 150 people just were on that one page? And how many ministries and how much would grow out of that? I already told you I'm committed. If the most famous Christian tomorrow came knocking on my door asking me for a job, you know where I'd send them? Steve. Because I'm submitted. And you know what his job is as a father and as a leader? To make his ceiling my floor. Millennials, that's what we're missing. We don't understand. Taking the gifts of the older generation and allowing them into our life. So that when we move forward, we have a great, great, great resume. Like we have so much. <laughs>